Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. One thing I want to make sure you guys could tell is that we included a QR code for those of you who want to get the presentation. We have it online for you guys to download. That way you don't have to uh, take pictures of every slide that you're interested in. Do we already, we've already published it for you. So thank you for coming. This, uh, we're talking about evaluation of the OpenStack deployment frameworks that we covered this summer uh, over the, uh, um, uh, in the last three or four months. So what we're covering today is a little bit about who Semantic is, uh, who we are, uh, why do we do this, right? What was the purpose? Um, so what our proof of concept goals were, our criteria, and then um, some of our conclusions on specifically some of the frameworks that we looked at. So uh, what is Semantic doing? Why are we even involved in OpenStack at all? So first of all, uh, I want to tell you a little about us, and then we'll go into that. Semantic, for those of you who may not know, I think most people probably do know who we are. We're a security company. We're very focused on building um, a secure uh, environment for people to work in, to build workloads on. Uh, we cover everything from backup storage to security products like antivirus, um, uh, uh, compliance products, as well as the PKI uh, certificate business that they have. A little bit about myself. So uh, I'm Brian Chong. I am an infrastructure architect for the Cloud Platform Engineering Group for Semantic. My specialties are network and security, really focused on uh, basically designing um, uh, the OpenStack application level platform. Um, this is my colleague, Shane Gibson. He's also an infrastructure architect. He is very focused on sort of the uh, frameworks, the bare metal provisioning, as well as sort of the network uh, physical layer topology. So uh, one thing I want, I want, so some of the things we're really trying to tackle with this is really attacking some of the harder problems at scale for some of the applications that we're going to be building. So I want to talk about a little bit about what exactly Semantic is really trying to focus on through this opportunity of using OpenStack. First of all, we're building a brand new cloud platform to be used within Symantec. This is pretty challenging for us. Um, we have a very diverse set of technologies, and we have a lot of things that we want to build on. So we're trying to start in a greenfield manner. We're building a brand new cloud from scratch. Um, second thing is we're trying to make it very global, right? We're looking at using multiple data centers around the world, as well as different teams. And we're very much focused on an open source, open platform model that we want to use. Uh, the reason why open source is critical to us is for two reasons. One, as you probably heard, it's a lot about flexibility. It's a lot about design parameters. And we want to be able to control our destiny, right? I think over the years, uh, we have learned as uh, infrastructure architects that you know, whenever you have a very complex problem you're trying to solve and use very complex solutions, you need to have the ability to understand them and how are you going to attack them, uh, attack issues that arise in the platform when you're not, uh, when it's an enterprise cap uh, scale capability. And we, this is not only true for the platforms that we use and we purchase, it's also the platforms that we use internally that Semantic builds. The second thing we want to talk about is we're really trying to build an IAS layer platform. So this is, we will be building services on top of OpenStack, but we're really focused on OpenStack as an IAS platform. I know that uh, some people may use OpenStack in many various ways. I know there's lots of projects, but our main focus at this point is to use OpenStack to build a internal uh, infrastructure as a service platform. Uh, one of the things, also reason why Semantic is included is trying to get into OpenStack is we feel that there is a large value that Semantic can bring to the OpenStack community by looking at the platform, helping to secure it, and actually contributing back to the community some of the things that we find, whether they be bugs or security holes, or even the ability to enhance OpenStack right, with some of the capabilities that Semantic has internally in terms of our engineering staff, as well as our architecture capabilities. And we're starting small. right? So um, I think one of the lessons we learned was that you, know, you can't get out of the gate with something so complex as OpenStack. We wanted to make sure that we started with something small, understood it, got our hands wrapped around it, and then we're going to scale this to thousands and thousands of servers across multiple data centers worldwide. Because I think some of the services Semantic is focusing on are definitely re require um, many, many servers. Uh, uh, give an example. Some of the things we're looking at is like uh, the current OCSP service that uh, we run. Right? It takes billions and billions of transactions. We're going to need a very large footprint to post that, something like that on a cloud platform that we're looking to design. Oh, I'm sorry, on, online certificate status protocol. 
right? So I don't know if you're familiar with um, uh, Symantec purchased the VeriSign CA business, 2010. So we're talking about some very large platforms that we're looking to build. So everyone within Symantec is pretty excited uh, to be using OpenStack, and we're, um, we're really looking forward, right, to its capabilities and see it really pushing it to its limits and seeing how far this thing can scale. So, but why, what are we talking about today specifically? So that's sort of semantic long term, right? I think you guys are here really to learn about what did we actually do and why did we do it? So we started in April, and one of the first things we learned about OpenStack is we have to figure out how to get this thing installed. I think we learned by reading, we weren't gonna go download it from GitHub, right, and try to do this by hand, right? I think that's very difficult. I know some people have tried it, and it takes many months and weeks, and you know, we thought we didn't have the time to do that. So we went to look for certain vendors that we felt could help us in our journey and get us there faster. Um, we evaluated five different methods, which we'll be going, a chain we'll be going over today. Um, and we, one of the focuses is we tried to really focus on open source, right? As, as we said, so these are open source platforms. We're not really looking at um, uh, enterprise version deployment tools. So there are three major areas we looked at um, uh, before we go into technology. Capabilities, what could it do, right? What was a tool capable of actually deploying, whether it could do bare metal, um, could it do the networking? Uh, you know, was it able to do install checks? Resiliency was actually key because we believe we'll be redeploying OpenStack very frequently as we scale. So when you have many thousands of nodes and lots of different clusters, we knew we'd have a rolling model, right? Especially as the frequency and the cadence of which OpenStack deploys. So we, we need to make sure that the tool itself was part of our actual lifecycle process and it itself had to be resilient on its own. Right? It couldn't just deploy OpenStack resilient, it actually had to be resilient on its own as well. And complexity. Because of the various services we're looking to build overall um, and the different network topologies that we're looking to deploy on this for security purposes, uh, uh, compliance purposes as well, audit capabilities, we wanted to make sure that the tool had the ability to handle extremely complex configurations as we went through the different um, uh, services that we want to build on this, whether it be PaaS services or true SaaS services. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Shane, and he'll go over some of the more specifics of what we did during our deployments. Thanks, Brian. So obviously, when you deploy on doing something new, it's uh, generally a pretty good idea to have an idea of what you want to exit with, an idea of what success is. And not knowing a whole lot about OpenStack, uh, we knew, uh, starting at the bottom here, that we wanted to get OpenStack up and running. We needed to be able to test it, to learn how it, it, it works, how it runs, how it's configured, different ways of designing and architecting OpenStack. Um, primarily, though, we wanted OpenStack up and running on our hardware, in our data centers, in our environment, that our teams could learn, uh, get their hands on, deploy, automate, test. Uh, some of the specific nitty gritties we were interested in was adding, deleting, modifying uh, nodes. We're going to be rolling lots of equipment out and bringing up uh, more and more equipment as we go through our different iterations and growth phases. So we needed the ability to, to be able to quickly and easily deploy, redeploy. And we also knew that obviously it needs to be as few manual steps as possible. We need to be able to automate it as much as possible and preferably with an API because we know we'll be developing our own frameworks to drive this, and we want to be able to drive the tool through some sort of API methodology. Uh, through the proof of concept, we needed to make sure that we started this, the proof of concept with a vendor and a specific product, did a deployment on a cluster. That deployment methodology was documented on our hardware, on our environment with our network topology, and then we handed it over to another semantic employee and had them redeploy. And that's what we defined as how long it took us to get from uh, bare metal to up and running OpenStack. Uh, sitting down, we had to figure out how we were going to test the deployment tools and how we were going to test OpenStack. And for those of you um, that are new to OpenStack, you'll find uh, there are a number of network elements that you need to be aware of within OpenStack. Uh, there's a number of primary core uh, OpenStack networks. Uh, starting uh, at the bottom, you have your public network where your VM guest traffic ingresses, egresses, your services are exposed, essentially your applications are exposed. Uh, above that, you have your API and your management and, uh, network segments. That's where your uh, OpenStack controllers compute and all of those various things talk on their API level. Private and storage networks, that's where your 
uh, VM guest networks work. That's where your storage connections through uh, object store, et cetera, are. And above that is the admin network, which is specific to the deployment uh, framework, where you actually do the Pixie boot, the OS install, and management of the physical cluster. Uh, the last network, the very top one, is the BMC or IPMI network. That's a physical hardware control network. We wanted to separate the network environment out into four, um, well, five if you include the BMC IPMI network, but four OpenStack networks, physically separate networks, so that we could have the ability to uh, define what traffic can come in and out of those networks. A lot of people that initially deploy OpenStack, they deploy it all on one network segment, and we felt that was an insecure uh, method of deploying OpenStack. We want to control access to the APIs, the VM guest networks, to the uh, private uh, management networks, et cetera. Um, going through the deployment uh, with the various different vendors tool and tools, one of the things we learned very quickly was, well, there are hiccups along the way, and things don't always go as smoothly as you hope they would go. And so we ended up plumbing up our, uh, what was our jump box with a, a, a VLAN trunk and uh, configuring it with an IP address for every network segment so we'd have a, an ability to test because we closed off all of those networks. You have to determine if you actually get the network level up and working and functioning correctly. So that was a real big learning point for us. And for those of you who can't read the small print in the very corner, yes, we know those are not, a valid I, or not our valid IP addresses. But, uh, so this is the network topology we came out with. We used three clusters of five nodes. Um, that caused us some problems, too, in some cases, because we weren't able to do a lot of the HA testing in OpenStack with just five nodes, five physical nodes. Uh, and each of those clusters were completely isolated network segments. So there's essentially uh, uh, 15 networks and 15 VLAN segments there. Uh, outside, stepping outside of the network uh, topology, we came up with a, a fairly standard uh, OpenStack uh, design topology. Uh, we initially placed, actually throughout the whole test, we placed the admin node on a piece of bare metal on its own. Uh, in retrospect, we probably wouldn't have done that. We would have uh, spun up a VM guest for the admin node configuration and not dedicated a physical piece of hardware to the admin node, especially with such a small cluster. It was it, one of those learning points we went through. Uh, we set up a controller, two compute nodes, and a storage node. Uh, in their, our testing, we only had one storage node for object store. That was another learning point. It was really tough since Swift. Uh, typically, you want three nodes uh, to be able to do uh, replicated object capabilities. So we got into a number of scenarios where we had to hand deploy Swift, and a lot of the, some of the tool framework tools were unable to do the deployment uh, with a single node. And so that caused us a little bit of uh, heartache and burn. If you're going to test object store, I highly recommend that you guys get at least three nodes uh, or put a little time and effort into doing uh, three VM guests to do your basic Swift or uh, object store capability testing. So once we've sort of defined the uh, network environment and topology and the OpenStack uh, topology and architecture that we're considering testing, we uh, got on with the actual uh, provisioning evaluation. Uh, one of the things I really want to highlight and stress throughout this talk, um, all of the tools that we tested are based on features at the time, obviously, that were available over the summer during the test frame from uh, April to, we finished, what, September 30th, uh, so over a three or four month period of time. Uh, all of the vendors' tools have been evolving dramatically and rapidly. So uh, when you guys sit down to do any of your own evaluation of the tools, uh, I would look at all of the tools with a fresh uh, set of eyes. And all of the, you know, like I said, they're, evalu they're evolving very rapidly kind of like OpenStack is, right? Every release brings a, a whole host of new features and capabilities. The five main uh, tools that we tested uh, were the F Fuel Web, Maranta's product. Uh, at the time, it was version 301. Uh, Fuel Web at the time was a standalone product uh, separate from their Fuel CLI server. Uh, we chose to implement the Fuel Web server because we wanted to get it up and running very quickly, and it was a lot less time to learn all of the CLI deployment capabilities and uh, requirements for this, the CLI product. Uh, Canonical's uh, mass Juju product, uh, versions 1.2, 0 0.7, uh, those products have been revisioned significantly since. Mass is the metal as a service, it's the bare metal provisioning component. Juju is essentially their DevOps tool slash glues other DevOps tools 
uh, together. They use uh, charms to deploy uh, through the Juju tools. Uh, Crowbar, uh, supported by Dell version 1.6. Um, that product uh, kind of glues together a whole bunch of chef recipes and the Crowbar framework. Um, clearly strong integration with Dell hardware since it's born out of some of Dell's requirements for deploying uh, um, OpenStack, but it's not exclusively uh, Dell. Um, Foreman, uh, a lot of people know of Foreman. It's a general open source uh, deployment framework tool. Uh, we deployed with version 1.2 uh, in conjunction with Red Hat, who helped us with that deployment. And then last, we deployed uh, Rackspace Private Cloud. Uh, Rackspace Private Cloud is not a deployment framework of its own. It's, um, it's a set of chef recipes for deploying OpenStack. So it's not, it, it, it broke our requirements in that it's not a bare metal provisioning solution that gets you up from bare metal all the way to OpenStack running. Uh, however, we felt that Rackspace has a relatively significant uh, influence and impact in the open store, uh, OpenStack uh, world, so we wanted to see what their product was capable of doing. Before I go on, I'm sure a lot of you out there that have looked at frameworks in the past are going to say, well, what about what, you know, this or that? You know, why didn't you try and test this or the other thing? There's a million things out there. I want to acknowledge that there's a ton of great tools out there, and we didn't test a whole lot of things. Uh, some of them we still would like to test and continue to keep an eye on, uh, but we are aware that there's a lot of other uh, interesting tools out there. Starting with uh, Fuel, um, Fuel combines together a significant number of uh, open, uh, open source tools and products into one suite. Um, they've integrated a tremendous amount of components uh, to get it up and running. One of the things we found interesting was at the time they were using Postgres as sort of the back-end data store for the Fuel web product. Um, sort of interesting because they deployed MySQL for OpenStack, so you had two different database platforms you needed to look at. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing, just something you want to be considered, consider and be aware of. Um, take a look at their requirements and see if they've, they've changed their database backend, or at least be aware that you need to uh, know how to deal with two different database types. Um, their deployment um, at the time, uh, Swift, uh, or not Swift, but the uh, Fuel uh, product itself, the Fuel web product itself was a, a relatively young and new product, and they hadn't bubbled up some of all of their capabilities from the CLI. So we, we had to deploy a few of the components by hand. That's since been rectified. Their um, Fuel CLI and Fuel web product have been unified. So if you take a look at that, you'll find that a lot of the capabilities that we had to deploy by hand are now native with the Fuel web product. So you'll find there's a better uh, experience there. Uh, after the uh, Fuel product, we went to, uh, went to Canonical, and they came on site. And we deployed uh, Mass Juju. Um, Mass is the, like I said, the, the Mass product is a bare metal provisioning tool. It has really strong multi-region, uh, multi-data center capabilities with their global and local regional controllers. It's actually one of the only products that had a multi-site aware capabilities out of the box. Uh, Juju Charms is for the deployment of the code. Um, one of the things that we found, uh, particularly with uh, deploying with Canonical's Mass Juju, is we were adamant about our five node model and how we wanted to deploy it. And Canonical kept saying, that's not the right way to deploy it with our tool. We learned our lesson. We should listen to the vendor. They're, they were definitely smart. They know, they know what they're talking about with their own product. So, uh, we should have been a little bit more flexible with it from that perspective. Um, because of that, we had a bit of a problem with the OpenStack charms uh, deploying on a five-node configuration. Uh, it definitely wants to be able to deploy on a 10-node configuration. After uh, deploying with the canonical uh, Mass Juju product, uh, Dell came on site with their Crowbar product. and. Uh, we did the implementation with Crowbar. Uh, Crowbar is a uh, version 1.6 is uh, very tightly integrated with uh, Chef Server, so much so that uh, the Crowbar tool was dis de storing a lot of its state and information data in the uh, Chef Server uh, for being able to do its deployment topology. Um, they, they were one of the products that um, deployed uh, native with their deployment uh, monitoring 
and graphing capabilities. And it was nice to see the tight integration. So as soon as you got a deployment up and running, you had an entire monitoring framework that was available and running right out of the box for you. It was a really nice, tight integration uh, with Anagios and Ganglia. It was the product that they uh, deployed as well. Um, interestingly, they did a great job of uh, bubbling up a lot of the configurations and knobs and twiddles, things that you can change uh, with the OpenStack configuration itself up through the Crowbar UI. So you can make uh, specific changes. For example, you could change between UUID or PKI uh, for the Keystone configuration. You have a lot of options that you can tweak and change. Um, they were very, very quick to deploy possibly because they were on Dell hardware? Maybe, maybe not. We've only experienced deploying Crowbar on Dell hardware, but it was very impressive how quickly they were able to deploy on the Dell hardware. One of the nice features if you're a Dell shop is they have the ability to put specific point releases of BIOS firmware on the machines that they've tested and they know works with OpenStack and works well with the Linux distribution that they've deployed on. And that's a really nice feature as well as a tight ability to do configuration of the RAID hardware level. Um, that was one of the, the places that it shined very specifically. Uh, Crowbar is in the process of um, moving from Crowbar 1.6 to Crowbar 2.0. And now they're bringing in a whole lot of new features and capabilities within the Crowbar uh, uh, 2.0 framework. Deploying Foreman uh, isn't uh, specifically a, an end-to-end -end automation framework, um, but working with Red Hat, they did a lot of work in the professional services engagement to give us a configuration to get from the bare metal to OpenStack up and running. Um, Obviously, if you're familiar with Foreman, it has a very interesting model where they do what they call smart proxies. A smart proxy might be something like a DHCP server, or a DNS server, or uh, your puppet server. It has the ability to manage multiple, quote unquote, smart proxies remotely. So you can have a very strong distributed model with your Foreman environment. If you're a puppet shop, um, they've had um, puppet integration with Foreman for quite some time, um, where Foreman can act as the ENC for the uh, Puppet environment and run deck as well as a good tool for automated uh, capabilities within uh, form and puppet configuration capabilities. Uh, form and I believe is in the process of doing a lot of work right now to extend to some of the other DevOps tools. So if you're not a, a puppet shop, there's a story there uh, for form and as well, possibly. Um, so like I mentioned, it requires a lot of customizations. You have to configure uh, Kickstarts, you have to do a lot of work to get to the point where you get Foreman to the point to be able to do all the deployment for you. Rackspace Private Cloud, uh, their implementation is through Chef. So uh, since they're not an a end-to-end framework, uh, we had to get our operating systems up and installed, the networks configured, uh, Chef server in place. And then uh, Rackspace did a deployment uh, from that point on. Um, they, uh, at the, one of the things that's interesting about Rackspace is they have a very strong view of what works and what doesn't work. They run a significant, significantly sized, possibly the largest size. Uh, there's some discussion about whether Rackspace has one of the largest uh, uh, OpenStack uh, deployments in the world. Um, so they have a very strong idea of what does and doesn't work in production. And so their implementation uh, initially was Nova Compute, Nova Networking. Um, they didn't want to deploy Neutron because they didn't feel at the time it was uh, ready for high availability, which was one of our primary uh, drivers. And so uh, we initially deployed with Nova Networking uh, with their advice. And then uh, we did eventually deploy uh, with Neutron and the L3 agents specifically, which is the, the issue with uh, enterprise grade capability, or at the time was with uh, Neutron networking. I believe Havana has a significant amount of work that they've done around the L3 agents and the Neutron networking components that are bringing it up there so it's much more closer in, in capability and parity with uh, Nova networking capabilities. So once we'd gone through all of the um, different implementations and we had to sort of sit down and figure out how all they went. And it was an interesting process because for the most part, all of the tools were fairly different from each other. Um, there were, like Rackspace not being 
uh, end-to-end -end automation framework. It obviously there were some of those what we felt were requirements um, that we needed weren't there, but their implementation of uh, OpenStack was very good, and they had a very strong implementation view of how OpenStack should be deployed, which is, is good when we're a uh, young uh, OpenStack growing uh, group within Symantec, having guidance from someone with experience is important. Uh, the TTC column there is, is my little uh, time to cluster uh, column, so it's how fast it took us from the beginning of the engagement to a fully up and running operational uh, OpenStack environment. Um, documented by the, the vendor that came on site to do the professional services install, and then another one of our employees to do the implementation. And so the time to cluster for Crowbar was four days, Fuel, uh, Web, Rackspace, Mass Juju were eight days, and five days with Foreman. Um, some of the, the issues that slowed down uh, the other configurations was because of our five node environment, we had to do some of the things by hand, and that really slows things down when you, you, you break the automation capabilities of some of the tools. So it then takes a bit longer to work out how to do all the implementation and deployment capabilities. Uh, capabilities, resiliency, and complexity refers back to the, the slide earlier in terms of capabilities being the bare metal provisioning, uh, the, the uh, high availability, and uh, resiliency is the, the open stack high availability and the deployment tool high availability. The complexity is the ability to deal with the multi-network environment and being able to, well, indirectly it turned out, the complexity of being able to deploy on a, a limited hardware environment of five nodes. Um, so one thing to note about our ranking of these things, uh, it's a reflection of some of the problems that we ran into in terms of the, our environment and our configuration. And I wouldn't look at any one of these and say, oh gosh, you know, there's a clear winner, or oh gosh, there's not a clear winner, because uh, in our minds, there isn't a clear winner. There are some that are better for what we need right now, and there are some that are, we're very interested in in the long term. Uh, the net that we came away from it with is we're going to be watching all of these tools as well as some of those tools that were on the we didn't test slide that we didn't get a chance to, to get to and test. And as we get more experience with doing, deploying OpenStack, uh, we'll get a little further along with that. Once uh, we had gotten the clusters up and running, uh, part of the engagement was also to help teach Symantec how the heck to operate OpenStack clusters. We don't have OpenStack experts. We needed to start building them internally. And so from that point, we needed to uh, validate and learn and, and understand uh, how OpenStack works from there. And uh, Brian, um, we didn't touch on, I think I skipped uh, through distilling all the slides down, uh, in addition to, or maybe I missed this, uh, in addition to that, there were a number of ways we, we chose to test the deployment framework and the tools. Um, we had three main drivers. We took uh, Horizon dashboard and basically used it as a smoke test, ran it through the paces to make sure everything works. And then uh, Brian wrote a CLI-based uh, tool to drive the OpenStack environment and actually test and exercise all of the components. And then we ran Tempest tests against a, a couple of the deployment iterations as well. So, Yeah, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about what did we actually test. So one of the critical capabilities is the tool not just be able to deploy OpenStack, but deploy it correctly, right, on the nodes that we configured. Um, one of the things that um, I also want to add to one of the things we were looking at, or uh, I specifically was looking for, was really the ability to tune, right, your OpenStack deployment through the tool. When you're talking about large scale, what we're hoping to do is not to have to have yet another tool like a puppet or a chef that has to lay on top of the deployment tool right, to uh, make further configuration changes, whether it be um, the oversubscription rate of your Nova compute nodes or any other tuning, right, um, that you want. So uh, one of the capabilities of the tool that we also had to focus on was, as you mentioned, a bit of bubble up, right, some of these parameters through the tool itself. So I just want to go over this slide pretty quickly. So we did do an exhaustive test of the OpenStack system itself after we installed it. There were um, some slight issues. Most of them were easily corrected. Um, either there was an error in the initial deployment of the tool of the OpenStack code itself, or uh, it was, um, as you mentioned, uh, some of the hiccups that we had a five node uh, cluster versus a 10 node, and so some of the specific uh, tuning parameters weren't there. 
so, but we did test them all um, uh, for, I mean, I'm not gonna walk through this slide exactly, but I uh, just wanted to make sure you understood that we did go through some exhaustive testing. Um, we also, as part of this, I also wanted to mention that we did do a security overview uh, of the tool itself, um, of the OpenStack itself, and I'll be sharing that on Thursday. Um, one thing I wanted to specifically mention was the difficult part for us to test was really the neutron component, simply because the complexity of the network that Shane explained. Um, we had a lot of different interfaces. We had a lot of different traffic flowing over the, over the system. And so we weren't really able to test that at scale. We only had five nodes. And the Swift was also an all-in-one. We only had one storage node. So we weren't really able to see the dynamics right, of the Swift as it went over different networks, as well as, it, as the data and objects were transferred between each other. But I just wanted to make sure you guys um, heard that we did do a lot of testing, and we did uh, cover all the bases after the deployment. So we know the deployment tool actually does deploy OpenStack correctly, and it does work. So the summary, uh, like I said, specific products, capabilities at the time we tested, everybody's tools are going through significant change. Uh, if you guys sit down to do your own uh, deployment, uh, you want to do a bake-off of different vendors, um, I highly recommend it. I wouldn't just sit down with one tool and say, I'm going to learn how to do it with this tool. It's a good thing to do. Uh, you'll find that everybody has a very different view of how to do deployment from bare metal how to do the operating system deployment, how to manage that, uh, how to uh, deploy OpenStack. There's a lot of, uh, as, as we all know or are learning through the summit, uh, OpenStack is a very complex beast. And a lot of different companies have different ideas of how to, the, their best practices, how to deploy it. We learned a tremendous amount about OpenStack going through this process of learning how different vendors decide to do their deployments and how they like or uh, different products or how they feel the maturity of different elements of OpenStack exist. So when you sit down and you go to do your own uh, deployment framework, I would take a look at all the tools we mentioned. They're all great tools. Um, I would look at the stuff we didn't look at. Write down what your requirements are. What are you trying to actually do? We, we did that, but we also looked at a lot of tools that didn't fit all of our requirements because there were compelling reasons for some of the different uh, the vendors that were, and the vendor tools and solutions for deploying OpenStack. Um, all of the vendors are, were really interested in feedback from us, and that was really fascinating to us. It was a side effect we weren't expecting because we were comparing so many tools side by side, back to back to back. We had a, a very good uh, view of how different vendors and different tools do their deployment. So they were almost all universally were eager to, to listen to us on what we felt were features or ideas or different directions that they might go with for deploying OpenStack. So it was really interesting to see how um, hungry the vendors are to get things right for enterprise deployments of OpenStack and get to that point. Did I get everything there? Yep. Questions? Yes. How did you uh, proceed? How did, how did you proceed? How did we proceed? So we are going with the Crowbar product. Uh, we're working with the Dell team to help uh, sort of shape the, the 2.0 product that they're in the process, uh, deep in the process of building right now. Um, the way we're intending to proceed is move forward with Dell Crowbar. Uh, the tool worked very well, um, but we're also we're very keenly keeping an eye on all the vendors because all of them had strengths that uh, were, were worth keeping an eye on. Absolutely. That's a good question. So we did the, the, the whole proof of concept started in, I think April. we had, We started in April. Well, we started discussions in April, but we started work in July, I think. I mean, if you want a specific timeline, I think we had the hardware and network installed in May. We started the project in April, me and Shane. Uh, we got the hardware set up in May, and then we pretty much every two weeks, uh, two to three weeks, we had a different vendor coming in. So that kind of gives you about the rough timeline. No. So yeah, so it was about, about three months total was the project from getting uh, bare metal um, purchased, ordered, delivered, installed, configured, and then bringing in the vendors. Each of the vendor engagements lasted from one to two weeks, and then generally we had a week in between each engagement where we tested the OpenStack deployment and redeployed it on different clusters and tested it again. But it took us about three months uh, to go through the whole process. Yes? Yep. 
Yeah. So, yeah, so the question was, did we consider which version of OpenStack, if I am paraphrasing correctly, um, with each of the tool vendors? No, we didn't really worry about that too much. Um, all of the vendors, whether they're on an older uh, Folsom or Grizzly release, uh, are all very quickly moving forward with the product. I think we deployed Grizzly on all of them. Uh, th we had some early access products and beta versions of a lot of the vendors' tools that hadn't reached the community at that point yet. Uh, that deployed Grizzly. So we did deploy Grizzly, I believe, with all of them. Uh, there were different variations of the Grizzly deployment that were deployed at the time. Uh, how much time do we have left? We have uh, time for one or two more questions. If there's, yes, again. Sorry, uh, real quick. Yes. You mentioned that you would put together some uh, uh, tools for scripting and testing. Are, there, is, uh, are you planning on making those available open source? Or? No real plans for that. It's just basic shells, shell script driving. Uh, the, the command line yeah, if just you, exercising. If you want after, I can I mean it's, it's nothing special. Uh, what I realized was uh, for our internal use, we weren't going to drive our platform to Horizon. So we needed to have uh, the actual ability to orchestrate the REST APIs in the order we wanted to. So that's sort of why I wrote it. So yeah, but if you want to talk about it, I can actually share that with you. It's not, there's nothing in there that's uh, semantic specific. If you do, uh, we're happy to share it. It's nothing terribly exciting. Uh, our contact info is here. Uh, it's on the slide deck. Uh, again, the QR code. So if you're interested in the information or how to get in touch with us, please feel free to drop us an email and, and touch base with us, as well as all of the different tools, their websites, and the versions we tested in their current version. So, any other questions? Any last questions? Yes, sir. How important was scale awareness in these tools? How important was scale awareness in terms of. Um, you said you got more large, right? Yes. So, so Yes, so that's a good question. Uh, it's very important. Uh, it's one that um, we ended up not evaluating most of the products on that solution simply because our deployment model uh, didn't really allow for high availability configuration. It was important that we understand that they can do the high availability. And in fact, uh, a couple of them are not yet a high availability product, but they all had it in their roadmap. So our fundamental belief was that the vendor will get there uh, if we needed them to get there. Yeah. It is critical for the long term, absolutely, yes. Any other, yes, sir? Yes, we did, we used KVM, mostly because that's what the, all of the vendors chose to deploy, not necessarily out of a desire of, of our own just to deploy KVM. The last question. I cannot hear you, please come. Pardon? Triple O? Did we consider it? We considered it, but uh, it was one of the tools we didn't test. We would like to look at it, yes. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate your time. Enjoy the rest of your summit.